first of all, I would like to thank you, Gareth, for your time. And it's an honor for us to have such an amazing composer with this amazing music and throughout all of these years. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, before we start with deep questions, we want you to tell us about your beginnings in the world of music from the Royal Academy of Music to your experience in Japan. Okay. Um, so I studied at the Royal Academy of Music from 2002 to 2006. And they gave me all of the tools to make music professionally. But what most music schools don't give you is life experience and uh, life in the real world. They don't tell you how to make money. They don't tell you like how to do your job professionally. But they did teach me you know, how to write for orchestra, how to conduct, how to use music technology, all of the things you need to do. And then you graduate and you're like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, so uh, I, I left the Royal Academy with, with all of these uh, different skills, but nowhere really to use them. Um, and that's not a criticism of the Royal Academy. It's an amazing like institution. It's just, uh, you know, I, th I think every, every artist needs to experience real life uh, before they can actually create art with some context. Exactly. Um, and in my final year uh, at the Royal Academy, I'm like, how am I going to make money? What am I going to do? Uh, and I remember being on Google late, late night in the final year. And uh, I saw this job listing. It was like, teach English in Japan. I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. I'd been to Japan once before uh, and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, hmm, okay, I'm gonna look at that. And they were like, what do you, and, and on the website, it said, all you need is a degree. You don't need to be able to teach English. You don't need to have like an English degree, just a degree in any field. Um, and I was like, cool, that sounds fun. Uh, and I got accepted into the program and I taught English in Japan for three years. Now, a lot of people, whenever I tell them this story, they're like, what does teaching English in Japan have to do with your music career? And, and the, my answer always is actually has everything to do with my music career because the things I learned in Japan, okay, I didn't learn any music skills, but I didn't need to learn any music skills um, because I already learned them. What it taught me is you know, how to be part of a group. Japan's culture is all about the success of the group, not about the individual. When you're making games, or you're making films or a TV show, a composer is part of a giant team. Uh, we're not, you know, a lot of people think the composer is in their ivory tower or you know, just by themselves. And that's not true at all. I think the best music and the best uh, games and best films all come when there's good collaboration. So th that was one of the first things I learned uh, while being there was just, you know, do everything to everything you can to help the success of the group. Um, the second thing, obviously a major benefit, if you're living in a country that isn't your own, you're going to learn some new stuff. It just yes. happens auto automatically. It just, you, even, if, even if you try not to, it's impossible because you're surrounded by a new culture all day long. I mean, one of the things I'm always telling people, which we can't do right now is travel, especially if you're an artist, because there's so much in the world that we are not familiar with. And if you can travel, and even if you just experience for just a few days, another part of the world, another part of the world's culture, music, arts, uh, you learn so much and it opens up your brain to like so much more. And I had three years of that, um, but I didn't just keep it in Japan. Because I was in Japan, it was easier to travel to other parts of Asia as well. Um, so, you know, I could visit China or Korea or Thailand or Indonesia or Burma or Laos, like any, any of these other countries was much closer to me because a flight from Japan to Korea is much cheaper than a flight from England to Korea yes. uh, by by a lot. So, um, so yeah, that's that's another thing that was really useful. And I guess the last thing, um, it's it's not as important, but I, I think I appreciate it more now. When you're teaching, you're standing in front of, in my case, in front of forty boys who who most of them don't really care about learning English. Um, you know, we, we all did classes in school, which we didn't like, right? Um, but they were interested in me. 
um, because in Japan, there just aren't that many foreigners, especially where I was. I was not in Tokyo. I was in a smaller city. Um, and my job really was to communicate clearly. They were actually very intelligent students. They knew everything I was saying. Um, but what I discovered is, is that talking to a large group of people who don't really understand your language 100% means you have to learn how to communicate clearly. clearly. How does that transfer to music? Well, if I'm standing in front of an orchestra who I've never worked with before, and I need them to play my music with a degree of emotion, they've never seen my music before, so they're not familiar with it, and I need to be able to communicate to them as quickly as possible exactly what I want from them. There's a massive crossover. Um, and I've, I started to appreciate that more in the recent years when I did a lot more recording with orchestra because I know I can communicate very clearly what I want. And I'm thinking, I started learning how to do this while I was in Japan. I didn't appreciate it until more recently. So, so that Japanese experience, there's so many more examples I could go through, but those are like the top three. But like that Japanese experience, I didn't do any music for three years but it gave me so many life skills that I'm still using today. Amazing. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, could you please tell us about your beginnings and doing musical works from movies and TV shows? Of course, since 2009. Um, so, so I actually started. Um, so, so when I came to America, I did uh, another university program for one year, uh, which was more, it was kind of like the opposite of the Royal Academy of Music. They, they expect you to have the skills and then it's more like, okay, here's a bunch of tasks that are things you would do in the real world. So it's kind of like one year of professional preparation. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to work. Um, and I started out, my, my early days were actually spent doing trailer music. Now that might seem like another thing that might seem kind of like crazy considering I'm mostly known for the soft Ori music. Yeah. But, the tra but some of my like trailer music um, uh, has ended up in stuff like UFC. Um, like you, you'll see it when some of the fight, not when the fighters are walking out, but when they're doing like the hype, the, the promo stuff and they, they sometimes play aggressive electronic music or, or something like that. Um, I was basically doing anything I possibly could just to pay the rent in my, my early years. And, and actually that kind of music does pay pretty well. Um, it's just, it, you just have to do a lot of it. But when you're young uh, and hungry, you, you, you are able to do a lot of work very quickly. Um, and I would say from 2010 to 2013, I probably worked on about 150 to 200 different trailers. And wow. then I did like a bunch of other albums of production music. Production music is music that just gets sent to various editors around the world. And they, they just have music to put into their shows. You see a lot of it on like reality TV shows. Reality TV music is not custom composed. They just take it from a CD and put it in the show. Um, so um, yeah, none of those trailers were actually for very big movies. Um, the very big movies, like there's, there's a lot of competition to get those jobs. I did a lot of the smaller, like maybe some small, smaller horror movies. Um, uh, but even those kinds of movies, they also need trailers, right? Yes. And it's, it's, for, for, for one piece of music, it was like a few hundred dollars here and there, but you do hundreds of them and it adds up pretty quickly. Yes. <laughs> um, now, all of the time while I was doing all of these different jobs, I was doing some student films, some short films, um, but I also knew that I wanted to get into games. And I was part of this website called moddb.com, which is a place where developers go to make mods for games, which just like add-ons for, for PC games. Um, Skyrim has a ton of them. It's kind of famous for having a gazillion yeah. mods. Um, <laughs> exactly. And uh, I did music for a few of these mods. And, and actually, uh, I can trace back almost every single job I've ever had to being on that website. Um, it's, um, it's the place where Thomas Mahler, the director of Ori, uh, found me. And it's also the place... Um, I, I did a game called Primal Carnage, uh, which was this humans and versus dinosaurs game. Very, very silly. Um, but what ended up happening 
is the, I think it was the animation team for Primal Carnage ended up doing some of the animation for the early version of Ark. And then the Ark developers were like, hey, do you know a composer? And they were like, yeah. And then I, they, they messaged me and the very first piece of music I wrote for them for, for ARC was the ARC main, what is now known as the ARC main theme. Um, and then I got the job. So, but that originally came from doing a mod on ModDB. Um, wow, amazing. And so, so yeah, I, and it's just one website and uh, you, you just never know who is listening and where they are listening. You, you just never know. Um, but I always think like stuff like that, it was probably just meant to be because they, they found me. But uh, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. And then of course, once I started working on Ori, I started working on Ori like full time at the end of 2012. Um, then I started, you know, moving into games more fully. And then of course, Ori came out in 2015 and everything went crazy. <laughs> yeah. Amazing job. Amazing job. So, uh, as we all know uh, that, uh, you were inspired mostly by Alan Silvestri. What is your favorite track from Alan and how did it inspire you? Uh, that's a, uh, that's an easy one. The, so my favorite, yeah. Favorite track from, uh, Alan Silvestri is the main theme for Forrest Gump. Um, and it's it's so simple if you've if you've seen the movie um the opening the opening sequence of the movie is literally just a feather moving through the wind nothing's happening like nothing is happening apart <laughs> yes. from a feather is is going through the wind and eventually it lands next to tom hanks and so the music has to carry the scene because without it that scene is nothing thing um now i was hmm, 10 11 years old when forrest gump first came out um so i was probably a little bit too young to understand fully the power of like that scene but even at 11 i could still recall it so many years later like the first time i watched it you can now when it. i watch it like i have an understanding of how yes exactly yeah um and i think it just that scene taught me the most the power of a strong melody um, there are so many different things you can do with music, but I think if you have a strong melody, it's the thing that makes your film or game timeless. And when I hear the first few notes of the Forrest Gump theme, I know it's Forrest Gump. And the sign of a good soundtrack to me is where within the first three seconds, you can identify it. To give you uh, an, an example of a soundtrack that has an identity with no real melody, Inception. Everyone knows what Inception sounds like. Yes. But it doesn't really have a melody, right? Like even time, like that's not really a melody you can sing, but you recognize it as soon as you hear it. And yeah. that's that's the key. Like, um, and so I think the main theme from Forrest Gump, the reason it hits so strongly with me is because I think it was the first time I became truly aware of how powerful music can be. And if you think about the opening of Ori and the Blind Forest, it's very similar to the feather moment from yes. <laughs> uh, from Forrest Gump. It's not as long, but I, I watched it and I was like, you know what, this is pretty cool. I kind of get to do my own feather theme. So uh, what was considered a game changer for Gareth within your career as a musician? The light bulb came on for me when we were doing, when we were working on the Ginzo tree escape sequence for the first time uh that i don't think it was a light bulb just for me i think it was a light bulb for the whole the whole team um now one thing i've become very very passionate about and not every composer does this and it's fine but for me i cannot do my best work on a game unless i'm playing it um, especially a narrative game. Now, obviously, like an open world or a multiplayer game, it, it, all games are different, but if it's like quite a tight narrative experience, which Ori is, um, how can you possibly know what emotion the player is going to feel if you are not experiencing it for yourself? And the first time I did the music for the escape sequence, I did kind of like this it was a little bit generic like battle music like it was chase music it was fine it it would have worked okay but i i i watched it and i'm like some something is missing because i i was watching it and playing it at the same time and this comes back to melody and i'm like 
hmm, I wonder what would happen if I simply just put Ori's theme on top. And it solved like everything. Um, and what I found, it didn't truly connect with me until I was like actually playing it with the controller in my hand. Um, because what that actually did is it made me also flash back to all of the other times I'd heard Ori's theme while the controller was in my hand. And this was the first time in the game that Ori's actually making a difference in the environment. And I was like, okay, this completely works. And it was like the easiest solution ever. But I, I'm not sure I would have felt that if I didn't have the controller in my hand. Um, would I have even discovered that solution if I hadn't like been playing it the first time I was playing it without the melody, something was missing. Um, because, like I said, without the melody, it was fine. Like, it would have been okay. It would have just been like a 7 out of 10, like, sequence. Yeah. Um, but with the melody and then all of the visuals and everything else, it, like, elevated it way, way more. And from then on, I was like, right, well, I've got to make sure that I play especially a lot like all of the big sequences, like all of the chase sequences and in Ori 2, all of the boss fights. Um, I got to play them to make sure that they feel good and that they're connected with the rest of the game. And basically from that point onwards, I've made a point to where possible play games as much as I can. Uh, now, not every studio gives you that kind of access. Um, and it's something I ask for all the time, but uh, for security reasons or some other nonsense reasons, they, they sometimes don't want to. I, I think in the 21st century, I think there's no excuse uh, to not be able to do that, especially with cloud gaming. Now, before the reason why big companies didn't give the stuff to composers for security, I don't work at Microsoft or, uh, you know, this is my home. And they're like, we can't send you a, a copy of the game. Well, now you can because cloud gaming is basically a thing. So if I'm like logging exactly. onto the server, I sh th there's really, in my opinion, no excuse, but I still think it's going to take a bit, a bit of time because I'll be honest, most, most composers do not um, invest as much time into the game process as I do. But the thing is, if you were doing music for a film, you would most likely not in every case, but most likely you would sit with a director and you would watch the film together. You would talk about the music. You would say which parts are good and which parts suck. And then you go and do it again. And then you have another meeting a week later and you repeat the process until it's, it's all done. Yeah. That's exactly what we do on Ori. Like I do some music. I try it myself. I play the game myself. Before I send it to the team, I'm like, does it make me feel good? If it doesn't make me feel good, there's no way it's going to make you feel good. So um, I, I write the music. I play it with my music and then once I'm happy with it, I send it to the team and then I get feedback from the team. Usually it's pretty good, but if it's not, then, you know, there's a lot of back and forth. Um, I, I just find it leads to a, to a better result. So um, basically since that day, and I can recall exactly when it was, it was like June 2014, um, uh, that when we finished the whole Ginzo tree sequence, not just the escape, but like the, all, the, all the level before it, the escape sequence and then the cut scene at the end because that to me is like one big long sequence once we finished that we were like that's ori right there like that that like it takes i think it takes most players like 20 to 30 minutes to get through the whole level maybe a bit longer um and it's we like it's one of the best 30 minutes in the game <laughs> right exactly yeah. um and we were like that's Ori. We like this. This is this is the identity of the game because it has everything. It has the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and, and then everything in between. It's perfectly paced. Um, so we, like that. That was like the light bulb moment for me. Um, and I think you know, <laughs> the quest always is is to try. Well, I was talking about you know giving the player something to remember forever. I think yeah. everyone who has played Ori will remember Ginzo Tree forever. That's kind of like, that's that's you know, for that's... sure. Uh, okay, uh, could you tell us more about your experience in winning the 2015 BAFTA and the Golden Joysticks Award for Best Audio and Outstanding Compositions? Since there were a lot of other huge games with amazing music back in 2015 as well. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the the award season in uh, for 2015 it was crazy. We we had The Witcher. It was Halo. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh there was ori I, and there was a bunch of stuff like that and it's other things that i'm probably forgetting um i feel like the the standard of music in games now is like ridiculously high um yes. and so honestly the the wins are like you know you, you you could like the last four or five years you could look at the nominations and be like yeah, that game could win, or that game could win. You could make a case for every single game. It'd be pretty easy. Like, I could easily make a case for Witcher 3. I could easily make a case for Halo 5. Like, it, it would be very, very easy for me to make a case for the other games and why they should win. And I think those other games could say the same about Ori as well. Like, um, and it's the same this year, you know? Like, yeah, how do you choose between Ori, Will of the Wisps, Ghost of Tsushima, um, like, <laughs> Spider-Man, um, there's like so many good uh soundtracks um so i'm happy like honestly when i get the nomination because that's it's like if you're in the nomination it's kind of like you know the, the top five or top six that you're satisfied cool. with that yes yeah. <laughs> yeah like the win you might as well just toss a coin or go to the casino or something like that you know it's like uh you just you just never know because because a lot of it is down to personal taste after that like uh depending on who's voting and it really doesn't matter so um the, it's it's what i really liked though is that you know ori's not a big budget game not even the second one like it's you know um especially compared with some of these other projects which are you know multi 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 million dollar projects yeah. um ori's not on that level so it's, it's very cool to see ori just even competing in that arena um and the biggest, this is going to sound kind of cheesy, but honestly, the biggest reward is seeing how many people we affected. And that's one of the good things about awards is it actually allows us to reach more people because it gets, gives us exposure in front of a big audience. Um, and, you know, still to this day, you know, people are still discovering Blind Forest for the first time. And that game is six years old now. Yes. Um, and they're still playing it for the first time. I think Xbox Game Pass has a big, it's been a big <laughs> yeah. help with that. Um, but like, it's it's cool because I get messages on YouTube. Um, people are still doing covers of the music and uh, I can still, sometimes I go onto Twitch and just randomly drop on people's uh, streams uh, and watch them. And they have no Amazing, idea that's amazing. Um, so, but it's fun to see because it's fun to see people react the first time. That never gets old to me. And if I did a film or a TV show, you can't get that. Like. When I'm watching someone else play, that's real time feedback on my work. Like, um, and it's funny, it's funny because we actually have that with Microsoft and testing. We're actually able to watch other people play the game when when we have our testing. And you can just tell when people when people think the game sucks, their body language and their face, their their muscles in their face are just like like this. Yeah. And then when when and then when they're really into it, it's like it's like this. Uh, they're like leaning forward and they're engaged um and so you can learn a lot just by watching people and uh you know just seeing how engaged they are and so that that can be very that can be very rewarding too um so uh yeah i one of the things um that <laughs> is frustrating about the pandemic is that 2020 award season was wiped out like yep. because <laughs> when you get nominated you get to go to all of the events um and so you actually get to meet a lot of other people and the, you know, there's some usually some nice food and drink as well. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, it's been kind of sad that we haven't been able to do that uh, do that this time uh, around. But uh, hopefully, it's not the, the last yes. time I'm nominated. So, and I think I think next year we might be back to some kind of normality. So, um, but yeah, we all hope that. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, my next question, Gareth, is what was your experience while working with Ubisoft in composing Immortals: Phoenix Rising? As we all know that you are the composer for this game. Yeah, so um, this really was my first open world game, uh, like truly open world. And as we all know by now, Ubisoft are kind of the open world kings and queens of the, you know, that's, yeah. that's what they do. Um, and um, the reason I was picked for the project, um, I did... I did um, some expansion packs for Minecraft back in 2016, 2017. Uh, one of them was Greek mythology and Ubisoft's Immortals Phoenix Rising is based on Greek mythology. And I think yeah. they heard that and was like, that's pretty cool. But also they were aware of my work on, on Ori as well. 
and um, yeah, I ended up on the game and I remember flying out to Ubisoft Quebec and uh they showed me the game and it was it was absolutely massive and i'm like oh my goodness this is like so much music how are we going that's to, a lot of work <laughs> how are we how are we going to to cover this um and so so the soundtrack like what we put on the soundtrack album it's like 70 tracks it's absolutely like crazy yeah. uh, i'm like i don't you know some people like to uh curate the soundtracks like to be to be like a, a good listening experience I don't care. Like I just put everything out there um, because I think in 2021 people can curate themselves on Spotify or YouTube or whatever. They yeah. can make that. You can make you can make your own playlist in 2021. Exactly. Um, but like that soundtrack is like three and a half three and a half hours of music. And um, the, but the way we wrote it, it's it's actually some of the the music it, it's long on the soundtrack but the actual musical content is a little bit shorter i will explain um so each the, the game is kind of divided up into different regions and each region has a god that has been imprisoned by typhon yeah. typhon is the main antagonist of the game so there's an aphrodite themed region ari's themed region hephaestus themed region each region has its own musical identity um, so, uh, I think there's, yeah, there's six different gods. So there's six different regions. Yes. And so that's already like six different musical styles that I have to start thinking about. But here's where it gets really fun. Um, each region has three different suites of music mm -hmm. that change in real time based on the action that the player is doing. So if you are in Zeus's region, you will hit there, you could hear one of three suites of music, but there's four different game states. Now there's a, so, so suite one will have suite one walking, flying, horse riding, or combat. And it can switch to any of those at any time. And I did three versions of these suites. So there's actually like 12 different tracks that you have to think about like when, oh. when composing and they all kind of like have to be able to change on the fly. And when Ubisoft first told me about the system, I was like, you guys are crazy. This is never going to work. <laughs> um, and then when I handed off these different versions of the, the suites to Ubisoft, so flying, horse riding, walking, combat, their job was to make sure that when you're playing the game, they don't change too quickly. Because if, for example, you can go from flying to horse riding to flying to horse riding, you can do that as much as you want in the space yes. of five seconds. Now, the cool thing about this is that we actually did this in August 2019. Like the first version of this, we did in August 2019. The game didn't come out until December 2020. So yeah. Had like <laughs> over a year to tweak the feel of it. And so by the time it came out, like generally speaking, the, the music, you know, the music system worked pretty well. Uh, and yeah, so, so, so that's like, about 75% of the music in the game. Um, the other cool aspect of Immortals is all of the puzzle solving. Yes. Um, and the, the puzzle solving takes place in the uh, Tartarus Rifts, which are like this, this underworld area of the game. Although they call it an underworld, except it takes place it, it, it basically in the astral plane. So you've like got all these stars. The concept of the soundtrack is we don't want a soundtrack that is just ancient Greece, because I think that's that, honestly, if they wanted that, I don't think they would have hired me. Um, they would have just hired someone from Greece. Um, yes, that's what they, they sounded want... too typical. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so they wanted a flavor of ancient Greece, but with 21st century production and musical ideas. And that's that's what ended up being uh, being the underworld tracks of the game and actually my philosophy for the whole, the whole approach of the game in general. Um, and yeah. Then there's boss fights as well. Like the, the game is absolutely massive. I mean, the boss fights were fun because they were just like, everything has to be very big and over the top. I just noticed you're wearing an Ori shirt. I, yeah. I only just noticed that now. Yeah. <laughs> you can see I that. Saw Ori in the back. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And you can see in the world of the wisps uh, yes. as well. In the, yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, Gareth, my last question uh, today is, as we all know, you will be working on Halo Infinite, Arc 2, and the animated series. Their worlds uh, and time periods are totally different. How will you be able to set up the tone and come up with something unique for each one of them? 
like you did with all your previous works? So, yeah, I mean, ARC, ARC is fun because I'm, you know, I've been working on ARC since 2015. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny because the, the joke now with ARC is like, oh, it was just a dinosaur game <laughs> once. And now it's like turned into this massive, like sci-fi epic thing with dinosaurs still. Uh, and we have another expansion pack coming out like next month. I think I think it's the final expansion pack for Arc One. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and yeah, it's it's been an amazing ride to to explore that game. But I'm very familiar with the Arc world, and so like you know, yes, it did start off as you know a dinosaur game, and yes, it has added all of these science fiction elements, and that's actually resulted in a natural progression in the music, which, funnily enough, you'll you'll hear when the next expansion comes out. You'll hear the latest evolution of Arc music will be with the the next uh, the next expansion, but then going into Arc Two, if you've seen the trailer, it's it's back to dinosaurs like it's it's very very primal and tribal and i remember talking with uh studio wildcard the developers of arc and uh like, yeah we need this to feel this, this is going to feel very very different it's a lot more raw and aggressive than than arc one if you think about the first time people saw arc one it's more like yes, we're on an exciting adventure and we don't really know why we're here. But for, people, for, for, for Arc 2, it's going to be, you know, the I can't say too much, but the story context is going to be you know, a lot more different. Um, but they are hinting that from the trailer that, you know, all of the, the sci-fi stuff is, is it, it's going to be there, but not as strongly as, as, as it has been in the expansion back certainly for, for arc one now the animated series uh is really exciting because it's i think first of all for anyone who's played arc one it's going to bring the lore of the game to life um because you know it's arcs a game where you can literally just chill out and do almost nothing or you can go really deep and like really explore quite heavily and there is the game has some pretty amazing lore that i think actually probably a lot of people aren't fully aware of unless you're a truly hardcore player and there's a lot of truly hardcore players um but i think the tv series i can't say what it's going to be about but i think you know it will bring uh a lot of the story of arc to life and and also give context to everything that's happened in the game but of course the, the you know the best thing about a tv series is it has to be character driven <laughs> um you know whereas the game is you know you are the characters in the games and you're kind of making your own stories yes um the 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 tv series is going to allow us to follow certain characters and follow their stories in the the arc universe and that'll make it more relatable to people who haven't played arc and I think for people who haven't played Ark, because I'm working on the series right now, and for people who haven't played Ark, they're going to see a side of it that they hadn't really seen before. And maybe it's like a, a new entry point for them to like consider trying out the game or taking a look at the game. And maybe just some people will enjoy the TV series. It's just cool that it even exists. Um, if you told me six years ago when I started working on Ark that I'd be able to record because Ark was an early access game. No one knew if it was going to be successful. Exactly. Um, I mean, maybe that maybe they did, but I had no idea. Um, but if you told me six years ago that I would be able to record at Abbey Road Studios, one of the best recording studios in the world, with an orchestra of almost a hundred players, uh, and then it would turn into a, you know, there would be a sequel, like six expansion packs, six, five, whatever, um, a, a sequel, a TV series. Like if you told me that six years ago, I'd have said you're crazy. Like you, you're like what? That's what's happening. <laughs> yeah, um, but it has. Um, I, I I I don't think anyone could have seen like how wildly wildly popular it is. Um, but I'm I'm very grateful. Is and I, I'm just happy that I get to explore this world because this this world is so massive. There's still a lot I can say with the music. Um, and then yes, as as for Halo, I. One day I'll be able to talk about it way more than I'm allowed to. <laughs> we uh, understand but I, but, that. But, but, the, but there is some stuff I can say. Um, so I think the, the most interesting thing with Halo is it's really the first time I'm stepping in to a world, a musical world 
which someone else created. Um, and um, obviously I'm talking about Marty and Michael uh, and then following them, uh, Neil Davidge and Kazuma. And of course, and um, Stephen Rippey for Halo Wars 2, Halo Wars 1 and Gordy uh, for Halo Wars 2. Um, there's been a lot of composers um, on, on Halo, um, all following on from what Marty and Michael did on, um, on, the, on the early games uh, when it was done under Bungie. And the, the first thing, I, I remember starting the project and it's like, wow, it's time, time to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. um because normally when i'm doing a game it's up to me to create the musical language because that's why i've been hired um you know immortals has a mus its own musical language ori has its own musical language arc has its own musical language if someone else worked on these games it's reasonable to expect that they would have to follow what i did it, let's say another composer did ori 3 if they didn't use the main theme for or from ori 1 and 2 People see Master Chief and they're like, they're inspired because he's there. Oh, Master Chief has come to save us. He's an iconic figure. And every time he's here, things get fixed. Like that, basically that's what happens. Exactly. Um, that, so there's a confidence to the music. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, Master Chief's a super soldier. Like, so, so <laughs> you know, um, and we, what we, I remember, you know, when we first did some of, some of the early combat music for, for Halo Infinite, um, you know, we want to make the player really feel like they are Master Chief. So it's it. The music is not necessarily always a commentary on everything that is happening on the screen. One of the big differences, I think, in games now, like entering the PS5 and Xbox Series X era and moving forward. I said earlier that there's a lot of great music in games right now. Yes, but. I think the difference now between a good soundtrack and a great soundtrack is not the quality of the music, like on the album, like on the album, it's always going to be great. Like, you know, there's the music, there's great budgets now for music. There's always orchestra. Um, and if it's not orchestra, you have like Mick Gordon doing an amazing soundtrack for <laughs> doing like, there's, there's just amazing music everywhere. Right. Yeah. But the, but the real key now is, and this comes down to taste and planning and like experience is how the music plays back in the game and that skill takes a lot it takes a lot more effort like because you can just put like great music in a game and yeah it'll probably work okay one of the things one of my things that i've like really like hope will change especially in open world games is you're walking through the environment and suddenly the combat music starts playing but you can't see what's fighting you like yeah. because but, but it's being triggered by you are you are near an enemy so like the drums start or something like that but like the enemy is probably really far away um and what i hope like what i like to call it as i don't like to call it combat music i like to call it the combat announcement it's like you are in combat now and that yeah. to me that sucks <laughs> that actually is not immersive to me um it should be like a more gradual thing like you know because the sound effect should be enough. The sound effect should be enough to communicate to the player. Um, but the reason why this has changed over the last you know, 10 to 15 years is because games have become more and more cinematic and more realistic. So therefore the music needs to be, in my opinion, a more have a more realistic feel and tone to it. Um, so that's something I hope will change. And it's I think it's going to be the difference between good and great soundtracks now is you know, every game has great music, but not every game has great game music. There is a yes. difference between music in games and game music. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that I think is, is really important. Um, it's, you know, because Halo ultimately is trying to tell a story. Um, and in these narrative games, you just, like I said at the beginning, you just don't know until you've sat and played it yourself. Yes. Um, you could, if you're working with a good music supervisor, they can probably, you know, take your music and do a good job for you. But I always feel like as a composer, like how can you truly know what's best for the, the game and the scene unless you're, you have the controller in your hands? Because here's the thing, gaming... Mm -hmm. It's an active form of media. When you watch a film and watch TV, it's passive. So you're not as engaged. 
there's something different. If you watch someone play Ori versus or, or Halo or whatever versus playing it yourself, it's different in the brain. Yes. Uh, it's just fundamentally yes. different. Uh, it, it's amazing. Like I, I, one day, maybe I will do a PhD on something like the, the difference in brain activity between like passive and active like media. Um, Cause it, I, to me, I think it's a very, very interesting topic. Um, but like, that's the thing. And that's for me as a composer, like I have to be actively engaged in it to do my best work. And so I think, yeah, if you think the standard of music now is good in games, I think it's going to be even better over the next decade. I totally agree. Totally agree. That was a that was a good place to good place to finish. I think. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, unless you have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, and we can't wait to get our hands on uh, Halo Infinite and Arc Two as well. And uh, for me personally, as a music lover, I can't wait to listen to the music of the thank these you. two thank games. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're thank most you. welcome. You're most welcome. Uh, thank you, Gareth. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to say for your fans here in the Middle East? Uh, thank you so much for, for playing, uh, playing the games I've worked on and for playing the games I haven't worked on. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, just stay safe. Um, and, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can get back to seeing each other around the world. Hopefully. Like, for hopefully for we real. Get to, see, for we real. get to see you here yes. in Kuwait once this pandemic yes. is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth.